Marita. I'm good. How are you? Let me close the door. I'm gonna make you. Hello. Hi. Hello. Let's see who else signed up here? How are you doing? Um, all right, how are you? So bright. Are you, are you ready to listen a little bit of biology? <laughs> yeah. Right, we, we had 10 people register. Maybe I'll send a quick email out just um, reminding everyone. Great. Oh. Here comes some more folks. Oops. Hello, morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Yeah. Hi, hello. There's someone here. Mm -hmm. In Spanish, we say sometimes buenas, <laughs> just buenas, to say whatever. Not applies to everything, right? Yes, buenas. A wild card. <laughs> yeah. When you are walking the on the path, you know the and the countryside, and and you see somebody coming, you're like a buenas. Yeah, whatever that works for, right? <laughs> yeah, we are just in good mood here. <laughs> what else, whatever. <laughs> hey, John, how are you? Welcome. Hi, John. <laughs> Sorry about that, I had the wrong link. Oh, I wonder where, where, where did you have that? Was that? I'm original? sure it was, I, I was, I was, I was going into the link from last week. So I'm sure it's my um, fault. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So how's everybody? Okay. Good, that was in your neck of the woods yesterday. We we tried to have dinner at the Dog Watch Cafe, but we had too big a group. They were all booked oh, up. really? Yeah. You should have pinged me. I would have come over and brought you a six pack at least. <laughs> well, we weren't there. They, they, they turned us down. We wound up at the Sea Swirl. <laughs> not, not quite the same. The Sea Swirl is a classic, but the hamburgers aren't so good there, I suspect. <laughs> no, we had fried clams and things like that. Yeah. No, I don't have it. We never had our um, our our private chit chat yet, Ben. We have to we have to do uh, that. Yeah, we'll make it happen. I've uh, scrambling a little bit. No worries. Wow, I was going to come without slides, but Melina's provided them. I am provided them. <laughs> Okay, so I want to welcome everyone to this third and last session on biomimicry finances for regeneration. And uh, today we will have our guest um, is John Fullerton, who has been working in the finance uh, world for many, many years. And in the 10 or more last years, uh, he has been working on how to regenerate that field and how to make uh, 
more sense, let's say, of, um, of finances in the world. Um, and we are hosting him with um, Hugo Araujo, who's a biomimicry professional, and he comes from the business world as well. And myself, who is, uh, I am Melina Angel, Angel, and, uh, and I am a biologist and I am a biomimicry professional. So today we are walking um, through this connection between the RCN, which is the Regenerative Communities Network, uh, with the thinking of linking the um, global capital and the global finances um, to understand how to link local with global uh, in this flow of resources. So the idea is to get inspired by nature and uh, to get a better idea on how nature deal with many of the um, issues that we are trying to figure out in the finance world in order to get uh, a better idea on how we can move these resources and in reality. So the session as the last two, we are going to get inspired by biology. I will be presenting a little bit of biology. You will be imagining how the finance world can be um, inspired by it and uh, how to we, uh, you know, like kind of broadening a little bit the perspective and the discussions um, about finance world inspired by nature. We will share possibilities uh, with the chat and spoken. We will be listening to John and also we will have um, a reflection by Hugo who had prepared um, a, a you know, understanding on a systemic understanding of, of the reflections we did, we have done. So to start biology, so I be, I'll, Today, I will be just wrapping up something. Um, we started with individuals with, you know, like connections between cells and how we can transfer cell, cell to cell resources and how this works at, at individual level, let's say. And then we went to exploration of ecosystems and how ecosystems work in order to share resources. And today um, we are, will be focusing on metabolism and metabolism is uh, the emergent processes that are, are in between individuals and ecosystems. So um, this is the image of uh, chloroplates inside. Um, and what we have in plants is is really interesting. Um, we have these leaves that they are looking for um, light and looking for, um, you know, like a space and gas exchange. And, um, and what happened for these cells in the leaves is that they are packed in, in very tight. And they have these walls that they, they just put it together and, 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 and maintain them in an, in an structure. And what they have is, um, you know, like this wall, cellular wall, and then is the cellular membrane. And inside of them, they have these uh, green dots that are the chloroplasts they, that have also a membrane. Uh, actually, there are two membranes, and then we have inside the chloroplast this kind of um, discs that they are connected, and they are the telocoids, and and that's um, another membrane. So, in order for the light to reach actual the actual chlorophyll that it is in the um, telocoids. Um, they had to pass lots of membranes and obstacles. So what plants do is observe the quantic possibility of that photon to cross all the barriers, all the molecules, all the you know, cellular walls, cellular membranes, and all the membranes in order for that photon just to hit the chlorophyll. And that's the 
quantic uh, observation that plants actually do. So they are really linking the light in order to uh, start the light, a light reaction with the chlorophyll. So the chlorophyll will come, uh, get excited by light, taking some water, and to start to transfer this um, energy from the photon into several molecules in order to create ATP. And the ATP will go into another um, cycle of reactions to create sugar, which is actually what plants do with uh, light and water and CO2. So, um, and create sugar because bonds uh, in the sugar molecule are very high in energy. So when you, when you can store energy in these bounds. So this is kind of a very light resume of photosynthesis. But what it happens is that we start to have like an input of energy and a reaction with water and a reaction with CO2 in order to store energy in some place. And these, all these processes are called the metabolism or the organic reactions. And oh, it's, it's not a very clear image, but it doesn't matter because anyway, we are not going to explain this. But what I want to do is to show you how complex can all these metabolic pathways get. And, uh, and actually it is amazing the amount of reactions and, molecule, um, and molecules that are involved in, in all these reactions. And this is actually what is going on in your body right now. So, and this is, can be really complex, like, <laughs> you know. So, but the simplicity of this is that you have one enzyme and you have something that you will change the structure. The molecule you want to change the structure, you will put together or you will separate things. So you have, on a space in your structure as a protein, as, a, as an enzyme that will fit with, I don't know, sugar or CO2 or water or whatever. And you will change the structure of the product of that uh, substrate, let's say. So this is kind of the simplicity of the enzyme activity, but actually enzymes are really complex. This is, these are different ways of, of model them. Um, and, um, and the thing is that they will have uh, like a packed um, spaces or they will have a little, a, a little bit more like a loses atoms and, and, and um, structures. They can be alone by themselves and they can be embedded in a membrane. And, um, and it, one thing that is really interesting about um, proteins and, and enzymes specifically is that they vibrate and they move all the time. And this movement um, is kind of strange because if we don't have um, the right hole or the right shape of the hole to, in, to, to react with a, a substrate, they want to react. Um, they won't be able to fix one to into the other. But uh, because this this protein, these enzymes are changing shapes all the time. They are just vibrating because there are so com molecule, so complex molecules that all the electromagnetic uh, field that these uh, atoms have between themselves are just making them uh, vibrate. And connect there and connect there and just being, you know, in this kind of dance. But one thing that it is really amazing is that when the substrate they are supposed to act upon is present, all the molecules that they are vibrating in the cell will collapse into the active shape. shape. So that means that for all the insulin, for example, that we have in the, in, in the bloodstream, it takes just 
one molecule of sugar for all the insulin in your body to get ready to attack the, the glucose and, and metabolize the, the glucose. So that's a quantum um, behavior. This is a, a superposition of, of we are getting ready to uh, do something. You, we are we are in um in a in a mode of uh, we need to metabolize something so we are just communicating in a no linear way but in a no local way to uh, act upon something so these are proteins these are enzymes and they will just process the um, the molecules and the reactions they have to do in a very efficient way. And one enzyme can do it in a large amount of molecules. It is no one-to-one, -one. it's one doing a lot of them. And the same thing happens with the AD, AD, uh, DNA. DNA um, is ruled by proteins and by uh, proteins that will do many functions. They can do, they can fix mutations, they can, actually mutate the DNA, they will um, uh, translate or duplicate DNA. They will, um, they will do things like, for example, if we have, if I am an adopted person, I can develop the genetic uh, illnesses of my adopted adoptive parents. And that's the way, the biological way to do that is that the information in the field of the family will, in the metabolic chain, inform those proteins that I need to produce some kind of specific protein. So they will take a little piece of one gene and they will connect it with another piece in some other part of the DNA and they will build another gene in order to produce the disease or the illnesses that it is in the field of the family field. And that has been proven that all these things is, is called epigenetics. And epigenetics is just showing us that uh, DNA is ruled by the metabolic environment. And the metabolic environment is ruled by neuropeptides that are connected with emotions, that they are connected with the feel and the psychological feel and the, um, you know, like cultural feel that one person, one specific organism is um, embedded in. So uh, this world is totally amazing and how we can uh, understand what needs to be modified, how we can create links uh, between uh, the information that it is stored and, and, and the information that we really need to read and how to make it real. Um, so um, we are coming into a really, Jim Carrington, Carrington say, uh, radical collaboration. Um, and I think that this is, this is really important because when we see proteins, they are collaborating in some way. When we see organisms, they are collaborating in, 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 in the same way. When we see ecosystems, they are collaborating also, creating niches and, and creating flows of resources and information. So the main structure that we have in nature about the scales that we have been talking about and that it is kind of difficult to understand is that there are just three scales. And this, uh, in this diagram, there are just two of them, the individuals, the, the orange yellow ones, and also the blue one. The blue one is the community, the, uh, the, the big, you know, like a, a collection of individuals that have different relationships between themselves. So this is, these are the two basic levels in nature, whatever it is, molecular proteins or 
or cells or organs or individual or organisms or ecosystems we are all functioning in this way this is the way and what happens is that all these relationships will uh, collapse an emerging level which is like in between of them it's uh, and is the is the the sandwich of them and it is like more like the group or the um or the uh you know the collection of the relationships that they had been created so is the think about organizations or systems on how we can move or the metabolism it, they are uh, amazing examples of this emergent level so and this happens at any scale this is how nature works so actually I had done this this diagram on um the individual linked with the community is this the spiral one and the group that it is the emerging and um uh when we work in a harmonic way individuals are expressing love which is like a taking the other one as itself the, the real big connection of being uh together with somebody else you know like the individual and the other and the trust that a community needs to create in order to just um, hold the relationship that they are happening inside of it. And that make the emergence of something else or, or uh, you know, and it takes will to do it. It takes um, the, the, the will to create something new, the, the desire for it, let's say. Uh, and I have this Ahi and Mana, which are the um, vital force expressed in a collective way or in an individual way. So no matter what scale we have, we can understand the flows of information and the flows of resources through those um, individuals or systems that started to be created that they are there that that they link with each other um so i have this vortex uh you can scan uh, screenshot this and or and scan this um qr just to go to the vortex and this is kind of the examples i just i just mentioned so the idea is how to be a metabolic enzyme, how we can understand and get into a better um, emergent process of functioning through this flow of resources that we really need to start um, uh, and push forward to happen in order to regenerate uh, the whole planet. So this is, uh, this is what I have today to present as biology. And, um, and what I want now is to have maybe um, two people to express some impressions, first impressions, and then we will listen to John, who is ready also to, to share with us a little bit. Yeah, the molecular biology is scary, I know. <laughs> Dita, please. Thank you. Wow, oh, so, so fascinating. Um, so what, one thing that, that comes up for me while seeing all that complexity and also, you know, how, how there is this fractal um, kind of, you know, the, the, the micro kind of reflects the macro as usual. And one thing that, that is emerging as well is that there is some kind of in the local independence between the, what's happening. So every, you know, there is a lot of local autonomy about how resources are. There, there are of course avenues in, in the organisms, but there are like local centers of influence 
that also feel relevant somehow for the biomimicry at the finan financial level so that there isn't like this vertical structure that is dominating dominating everything but that you know what's happening here in my hand is connected to the rest but is to some degree autonomous and they can deal with the resources in a, in a very straight way without having to come all the way to the center and then going back again so that feels really clever and and resource efficient somehow yeah and something that is amazing is that sometimes uh one kind of organism can in, invent or innovate in a Met, in a you know metabolic way pathway or something like that and this information it is not just belonging to that species it stays kind of a, in a library of how to do it and which is amazing is that other organisms can arrive to pick this information and say oh this helped us and in nature we call that convergence or homoplasy in evolution, it's called like that. When one characteristic or one way to do things, one structure appears in different species um, without no connection or not direct uh, filial reproductive connection of transfer of genes. It's kind of, there is like a feel, a little bit uh, like um, Rupert Sheldrake mentioned in the uh, morphogenetic fields that it started to create these um, connections and actually genetic code is an homoplasy. It just started to emerge in many, many different organisms at the same time, which is amazing. Like, a, you know, like the code for all genetics, uh, it was just emerging in different places. So it's kind of this emergence process happens without being necessarily linking everything and linking all scales, which is really important to understand if we want to evolve any system. We don't know, we don't need, and this is a worry we have when we think about link, you know, changing the world. We think that we need to link everything and to have everyone to know everything and whatever, but sometimes it just, um, a question of filling the field with the new information. So most of the, let's say, bumping organism relationship that there are happening already in the field, in the bigger field, they will maybe trying to get into that kind of emerging property. Um, this has been called also the, the hundred monkeys uh, phenomena and it has been really uh, criticized this uh, paper but at the same time it's something that happens at cellular level which much more um, frequency let's say that in organisms or it is easier to see it in a molecular level but actually that's something that happens everywhere and is happening all the time and it is really fast so yeah great comment thank you Dita. Can I just chime in on that last point you made, Melina? Sure. Yeah, so the, the research that I've done on the 100 monkeys um, phenomenon is, is mostly that it was, that there was sort of like a, um, a gap in the scholarship, that, that essentially there was this phenomenon that was, that was um, observed in a research setting but that, that you know there wasn't a, a formal you know a hundred monkeys and that the actual transmission um, of a, a cultural I can't remember what it was but it was a cultural practice amongst monkeys that purportedly like jumped from one um, place to another and the, the question as far as I understand it isn't that um, this uh, this it can't happen but rather that the the, the sort of the um the fact that it was observed uh was was not quite accurate um so that's my understanding i mean i've done a little bit of research uh, just enough to be dangerous i guess <laughs> uh, around that but that that as you're saying the, the 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 underlying phenomenon by which the name you know by uh, uh, uh that that the name is attached to I believe does have stronger um, uh, support in the research, uh, but you would probably know that better than me. 
Yeah, that's that's the details of 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 the confusion a little bit of what happened there. But actually, what is uh, the um, the important part of it is that pull us the attention into this is not just evolution is not a graduate long term process that we are just mutating and going through this natural selection that it is it is because. Because in the 19th century, all the Darwinian view and description just was just one description of the of one phenomena that happened in the Galapagos Islands. But it was observed the same thing in Indonesia, but other biologists called Wallace. And Wallace observed the same thing, but he uh, explained it based on cooperation and non-competition. But industrial revolution of Britain in the 19th century, it was about competition. So Darwin went into the Royal Society of Science and no Wallace. Wallace was considered an activist, no desire in, for the Royal Society. Mm. So, so when, we, when you go a little bit back in this history of the evolution concept, we have Lamarck, and Lamarck was, a, was, was saying that there is a potential for individuals to evolve. So it, it changed a lot of, he was thinking evolution in terms of individuals, in organisms. And at that time, it wasn't possible to, to prove that because he was connecting another field of information that for the science at that time was completely impossible to prove. But when we see now what epigenetics is saying, actually is very Lamarckian. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of bringing back the power of evolution as a species of big changes in our behavior and our shapes in our way to function to individuals, to organisms. So that's amazing. And uh, we, we arrived to the point of having like a two perspective together, understanding how this mutation from one side and how these proteins action and metabolic action in the other side, trying to make sense of information and making the flow of, of mm -hmm. changes differently. So we are actually in, confronted with a society that don't see individuals as important for evolution with the capabilities and the awakening of this understanding of we are really evolutionary beings so we can we are connecting that and, and i think that that's part of the crisis we are in now mm -hmm. um and uh the, you know like the specifically the economic and the finance system needs to understand and to you know like collapse itself in a way that will support the real evolution that it is going on. So we can have this transfer and changes that we need in order to vibrate a little bit more resonant with, with the planet, with what is emerging. Mm -hmm. Is there, so, is there time for, for me to ch chime back to that a little bit? I don't wanna- I don't No. Wanna... <laughs> okay, okay I'll, I'll, do that. I'll do that offline. And we can do it by the, in the chat as well, and it is really cool. So, John, I want I, I want to invite you to share a little bit or your thinking about this. Boy, what a what a rich discussion! I, we're going to need a day or two to do justice to this. Um, um, so, but thank you for that. I, I um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of. Uh, it's just a reminder of how complex life is and how um, brutally, uh, arrogantly, um, naively crude our whole financial system is. Um, and um, so our challenge is to, is to try to find the bridge between these two realities, uh, recognizing that you know, first of all, no, almost no one who is practicing finance 
would have any idea why that last half hour conversation is at all relative to them, not relative, relevant, <laughs> nor, nor relative. <laughs> Actually, it is relative, but it's also relevant. And so there's this huge just worldview chasm to cross. And then on top of that, um, the, the, you know, the, in fact, I'm, I'm working on a course on this, but the, the foundations of economics are built on Newtonian physics and a base of assumptions linked to Newtonian physics. So even if finance and economics people were to have enough interest and curiosity in the kind of intellectual foundations of their practice, they would find that the practice is built on a flawed foundation. Not only is it not quantum physics, but it's a mechanistic worldview as opposed to a living systems worldview. So, um, I mean, it, 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 this is just an enormous challenge. And um, the way I've tried to uh, at least begin to bridge these two worlds uh, and these two ways of knowing and seeing uh, is, uh, is through the, you know, kind of getting clear on first principles. And those of you who have heard me before, you know, I'm, I'm like a, I'm like a broken record, but um, there's, there's, in my opinion, there's a danger that people will just view the biological um, perspective as a metaphor and then just sort of, you know, dismiss it as just a metaphor because the literal application is so bloody complex that we honestly don't know how to begin. But I do think we know how to begin if we get clear on principles and the difference between our economy. And by the way, I can't talk about the financial system without talking about the economy because it's a subset, you'd be like talking about your cardiovascular system without talking about your body, right? It's, it's a subsystem of the economy. And so the two are, the two are one. Um, and, and a lot of the uh, sort of uh, fix the financial system conversations are really about responding to uh, symptoms in the financial system that you know you can you can throw wet blankets on them and and you're not really dealing with the root cause of it. But um, um, but what I, what I was going to say is if if we can at least get the idea that first principles are important and then begin to align the economy financial system around those first principles, we're at least beginning to head directionally in the right direction and. Um, and so I think the challenge we all have is to not get um, lost in the complexity of the detail, but also not give up on the profound importance of fundamental principles. Um, so what I thought I'd do in response to what Melina's beautiful um, presentation is, is, is just relate to what she just said in the principles that I like to use. I'd also say, um, just so everyone knows, um, Janine Benyus is one of my teachers. And um, so I, I've gone, you know, not deep in an academic sense, but, you know, I was profoundly impacted by her work. And she and I had a, um, uh, a, a wonderful dinner together years ago. And she explained that her, um, essentially her client demand pulled her toward, you know, in her terminology, um, uh, downstream to material design, material science and product design, but that she always had an interest in the upstream, what she called the upstream, which is the system, the economic system overall, as opposed to products and materials. Um, and I, I think she's moved more in that direction more recently, like in the last few years, but I haven't caught up with her on it. But, um, um, but I started in, in, uh, in fact, she, her, her principles are probably what plant, planted the seed in my head about the importance of principles. And I tried to use them uh, for my own work, but, but discovered that they really were 
created in the context of the downstream. Um, so for example, green chemistry is a principle which is very relevant to material design, but not, not a top 10 relevance to the entire economic system. At least that's the way I um, thought of it. So, so I always like to preface this by saying that, you know, these aren't meant to be the right principles. These are just the ones that I came to as the minimum number of fundamental first principles to begin to this journey of the economy and the financial system moving back into alignment with the way living systems work. And I'll, I'll share a screen real quickly. Um, this is something I'm working on right now. Um, so one of the principles, is everyone seeing that? Yes. Okay. So one of the principles I talk about is robust circulation. And I do use the metaphor of, or not the metaphor, the literal meaning of metabolism uh, to describe this, and um, and I go and I'm quick to say that yes, this includes our whole circular economy conversation. But the circular economy is really a very trivial and not accurate simplification of the metabolic process. And what we really need to do is understand metabolism. And then I'll go on. Um, this is some material I'm preparing for a course. Uh, Sally Gorner. This is a Sally Gorner. Um, diagram, but obviously uh, metabolism involves, uh, you know, reliable, healthy inputs. Uh, so, you know, I'm very interested in not just, you know, not uh, for, for humans, you know, the, the whole organic food conversation is really just the beginning. You know, we're saying don't poison ourselves, but in fact, uh, nutritious food um, is is a whole different conversation that we're not even really having yet. In fact, we're probably moving away from it with our whole shift to um, uh, hydroponic greenhouses. We don't have any idea what the impact of eating food that didn't grow in soil is going to have on us. Um, and then, of course, healthy outputs is part of a healthy metabolism, and that's where climate change comes in. So climate change is just a symptom of a system that's not metabolizing it's waste in a healthy way. Um, the, the, you know, to, um, I forget who earlier talked about, you know, getting um, uh, the, the circulation of money at the cellular level, not just top down, but this whole idea of, you know, we need to reinvest the sugars, the energy in the system and keep it cycling through the system as much as we can. Um, and then the whole system needs to, to, to stay in balance. And the other diagram I'm using is a, you know, is a, is a fractal circulation. Metabolism tends to work well in these fractal structures. Um, and so at any rate, the, the point is that um, uh, if we get clear on the principle, which is, uh, you know, use whatever language you like, robust circulation, healthy metabolism, we at least begin to, to um, know where to uh, work on our current economic system and financial system to make modifications. And, um, and Sally Gorner and some of her colleagues have even gone so far as to try to measure the metabolism of an economy using things like Krebs cycle mathematics well beyond my understanding. But I, I do think that the, and, and Bill and I have talked about this many times, the, the real measures and metrics conversation we're gonna to need to have around our economic system and our financial system has nothing to do with measuring the impacts that we're trying to measure now, although we'll continue to need to do that. They will, um, but those are really backward looking, you know, how did we do? <laughs> um, but what we need to do is have measures of, of vitality, of health, of metabolism. And, and what does that look like for an economy? What does that look like for a regional economy? What does it look like for a global economy? What does it look like for a corporation that's global? That's, you know, th this is, you know, lifetimes perhaps of work ahead, which to me, the, the, the danger is we don't, we, we get overwhelmed by it. So we just go back to working on symptoms. Whereas I think we can make huge progress if we work on first principles. 
and, um, and, and understand that we don't know how to measure robust circulation in an economy, but we kind of conceptually know what it looks like. And um, there's you know 10 things we could all come very quickly, common sense, to think about how to in improve that. So for example, the whole buy local thing, you're, you're, you're accelerating the, um, uh, the, the cycling of money and resources in a local economy if you source locally. Well, that happens to be perfectly aligned with the principle of uh, robust circulation. So A, interesting that that's happening organically. The system is, is, is emergent in the right direction. And B, we should support farmers markets. It's not that hard. Um, so that's, that's by way of connecting at least where my thinking is with Melina's much more sophisticated um, uh, discussion and maybe making a case for first principles that that is only of course one of them um, um, but the other thing I wanted to to share and I don't know just conscious of the time Melina how what are we what time are we going to it's okay you have two more minutes two more <laughs> too much no no um, um no but we're the whole thing we're we're scheduled to end in an hour right uh, and uh, in a half an hour, hour, like so, it's one hour and a half. Oh, it is okay. Yeah. Well, what I what I was planning on talking about, but but I, I launched into that in response to your presentation um, was some some work we're doing to uh, that involves uh, complementary currencies and crypto um, in a way that is and this is sort of new for me, but um, suddenly gotten very excited about. Um, so if we had, depending, how much more time do you want me to blab before I, because I that'll take, that'll take a good 15 minutes to. Wow. Um, in that case, sorry, let's, let's listen to Hugo because he was working yeah. on the principles. So just to wrap up, uh, what you were saying, and then we can jump to the other part and, okay. and see and what I can do it shorter than that. I just, I just don't want to start on that. If... Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Let's hear. Let's hear Hugo. <clears throat> hey, Jan. Thank you. I, I'm really looking forward to hear you. So I'm gonna try to make it shorter, so you have enough time to um, to deliver your message. So, in in my case. Um, I'm also taking my personal perspective and trying to, to bring what we have been uh, analyzing here and, and in this three-day conversation. And the basic thing for me was just if there is a better way and if behaving like nature or becoming closer to living beings, to, to a healthy ecosystems, to um, a, a metabolic earth, it could actually help us to, to see different opportunities and different options in terms of solutions. So to not to get trapped into the complexity on its own, but actually what Biomimic ha has helped me with the metaphors, it is to take a different point of view that is aligned with the context. So this is just a, a, a quick wrap up on the, on the relationships of the ecosystem. So different kinds of relationships and everything goes into a, a plus, minus and, and zero in terms of energy exchanges. And then you have different kinds of uh, exchanges and different kinds of content, but it is based here. So in terms of mathematics, what I found that it was linking and, and I asked that also, and I shared that with Stuart, it is a graph theory. So we're, we're understanding the, this graph theory and now it's becoming a, te a technology that is used a lot in finance. So in finance, they are using a, as an asset graph, for example, this kind of, um, of, of um, yeah, visualization, which we understand now as a mind map, but it's actually a mathematical, a mathematical formula, but visualized in a different way. So with this kind of graphs, they are, uh, doing fraud detection, uh, asset management, uh, portfolio management. They are doing so many things that uh, they just were in serious F, I think, 
with 300 something million uh, as a technology. Uh, and so it's growing and it is the base of artificial intelligence in many ways. And this is normal because in nature, you just use relationships are important. So if you want to see the community in between individuals, you need to see relationships. And actual databases, they are just single separated cells. So they are not taking into account their relationships in general. So it's very expensive to not to see them. So this is how a graph database looks like. And I think it's, it's getting similar to what Melina was showing us, was sharing with us, but it comes from computing. So when, when I see the planet, I think I was just looking for an image that helped me to, to um, share my visualization. It is, it is all a graph, actually. So nature is, is a graph from our understanding. How can we create all the links in between, in between all the, the, the data points, assets, and nature, and everything? So this is, this is part of my lifetime work, as you say. And therefore, I converted into, into this uh, idea of energy exchanges, uh, trying to understand the ecological interactions in any given ecosystem that could be also a financial one. So for doing this, I, I use a biomimicry thinking methodology, which is, as you said, it is uh, more from biology and from what Janine is using uh, specifically for products. But I think as biomimicry professionals, we've been trained to understand the principles. And this is where it became really interesting. And I will, I will say after why, but because when you see a principle, then you see a pattern that is deep enough in nature that you can do something else out of it. And usually these simples, these principles are simpler because we can understand them and they are less complex, but they are very, very important. So for example, uh, with seven vortex as bringing a, um, isolated data to connected information to ecosystemic knowledge, uh, I'm also uh, helping other narratives as region narratives to be connected. So what if we can connect the knowledge like this? Like this is a narrative that is already connected. So this is a way that I think also in, in your principles, but these are the patterns that we can see in nature. So for example, a superorganism has collective intelligence, distributed leadership, reciprocity and sharing, and sharing regenerative value and swarm creativity. Just to say something, and this, this comes from Thompson uh, in the team book, it's also science. So what I do think we, we need to, to go from to, it's from linear to ecosystemic, from maximization to optimization, from competitive to collaborative, and to, from scarcity to abundance, just getting into, into what Melina was explaining us. But this is very human, right? <laughs> The, the personal corruption that we are involved in, in general, is very human. So unless we move into collective values and we really share something uh, like meaningful and, and right, it's gonna be very difficult just to, it will always be a metaphor and it will never be part of the real life mm -hmm. because it is about personal ethics as well. So what I learned in the RCN when I met you, it was that uh, actually, we need to talk about bioregions, and this is coming also from Bill and from many of you that have been showing me how bioregions. So this watershed, this Mexico City watershed, done by Elias from Tayer Trece, and 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 these are some of the things that I develop over time uh, are as as uh, um, as tools, digital tools. So how can we connect all these things to make sense out of this equation? Do we have the computer power now? And I I think we do have it with a graph theory and how can we land this in, into, into the principles of our regenerative economy, which is the ones that you are working with. So I felt very attracted to this regenerative economy because of these principles when I, when, when I saw them. So I do see the value that you are bringing on the table with these principles. How can we do it? Because now is the time for purpose-driven enterprises, purpose-driven organizations. And these are the guidelines for, for these companies or these governments or, or these territories to behave in a way that is uh, naturally speaking attuned with the context. So of course, I, 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 this is, um, uh, just a small visualization, it is not to be fully under, understood like on detail, but these are the life principles that I learned in biomimicry. 
these are the, the regenerative uh, economic principles or economic principles. These are the traditional ecological knowledge principles. And these are Melina's principles that she added a couple in, in, in the real vortex. But what, what I want to say here is that they are all fitting with each other in one or many ways. So let me, do you see the, the full screen? Do you see the emerging window that is there or not? Mm -hmm. No emerging window. Okay, let me, let me try to, to share the screen in a different way. So it is not this one. No, now it's emerging. So I also put team here and they are kind of the same uh, principles and Melina's additions they are here. So we are all fulfilling the same kind of thing. So what if we can actually collaborate in a way that we can build a biomimic projects with, with regenerative principles with uh, listening indigenous wisdom, which is the thing that they, that they have. So I think there is a big opportunity on creating this collaboration in between us, because I know that when you go with financial people, just financial people, they, they might not even get into the complexity. But something that we realize, and, and I think it, it's in, in all sides, is that water is important. And we have not focused enough the conversation in water, I believe, because we have, uh, uh, in your principles, it doesn't really mention that is watershed based uh, in the bioregion. So it is something that I'm missing. And in the principles of the tech uh, that I saw, they were not mentioning that water was sacred for um, for indigenous people. So I think that this is this is where where we all shared something very very important, and we are not putting enough emphasis in, in this conversation. And the same might be for biomimicry because nature seems to be made to be regenerative on its own. So they are not mentioning like this, but what if they can fully join the regenerative movement and we can put water in the, in the center of everyone so we can like have this kind of convergence in terms of uh, metabolism. So homoplasy, as, as Melina just showed me and teach me uh, in this class. What, what I saw when, when I was trying to understand metabolism, and this is just a different perspective of the one that you have, is that it is about energy and materials. It is about consumption and conversion. And it is about the place that the organism it is a, a living in the ecosystem. So all is related to a specific place, which is the ecosystem. But this is other thing that we are not saying in finance because finance could move everywhere and they are not honoring the place as, as you like to put it. So if we can create this kind of positive feedback loop in between all of these, then we might be able to create a regenerative metabolism. But how can we actually measure or, or get into all of this? And this is why uh, we have created Virtual Gaia with Archie and Omar and, and the, the regenerative team. So, because we think that a new perspective brings uh, new opportunities and, and having just different visuals will help us to, to, as a business opportunity to transform the report into an asset and the cost into profits because now sustainability is being seen as a cost. But if we can move it into an asset from Archie's perspective, I think this is a beautiful way of presenting a better business in, 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 in the next day. So we focused on, on diversity, on Mammoni Valley Preserve to build a use case by using one or many different tools just as a, as a use case and understanding the territory with a, with a full different narrative. But what matters here is that we change the, the, the perspective on what is what we are looking for? Because right now we think about carbon credits. It's another symptom that we want to cover with a fund, another of these so-called financial perspectives. But what if we understand what a healthy ecosystem is? And then as having healthy nature as a reference, then we can actually go through for something. We have a clear goal or where to go instead of just uh, having um, fog and, and not being able to, to understand the complexity, then we put a model that is simple enough so we understand how healthy nature. And, and from this research on, on, on Virtual Gaia, my understanding from John DeLue is that we need functional ecology. We need 
clean and healthy water. We need a, a fertile and, and nutrient soil. We need a, an atmosphere that is healthy as well. Energy that is attuned to the, to the place and, and bioculture and nice government governance. So we're going from, from the past to the present to the future. So it, like the technology is one part, but the, the vision and perspective is another and important part. So for example, this is something that you showed me and I wanted to bring it here, uh, John, because I think this regenerative gap, it is important. So if now you are doing degenerative something, then you have a possibility to become regenerative by uh, attacking this regenerative gap. How can we measure it? Not just from, from uh, fires, but also from your current activity and how you should add value. And this is something that is already happening in biomimicry. So Dana in, the, in one of the interviews told us that, that one mining industry was already focusing on how to bring regenerative value to the land and restore ecosystems. So this is a gap that we are talking about and, and it is place-based knowledge. So this is why it's connected with, with the full system of seven vortex. So healthy bioregions for personal and planetary uh, alignment, but especially water-based. I think this is, this is something relevant. So how can we define these objectives in a way that encourages learning and adaptation? And this is what we are doing also in the RCN in, in, uh, in Costa Rica, in Costa Rica Regenerativa, bringing this narrative so we can build a connection between the, the top-down approach financial metrics with a bottom-up approach from the local local people and their lands. And also something that I learned in one of the conferences of Bill Bowie about the membranes. It's a, this possibility of building a digital membrane and bringing all the players together in a way that it is interesting for everyone. And we can create this collaborative funding that it is what we are talking about here. So, this membrane should be able to, to connect one or many methodologies because one thing is the tunnel, the other thing is the, is, is the thresholds. And we have so many methodologies that we need to accept diversity as a point of view instead of looking for a standard. And the last, the, the last one is, it is that it triggers my mind that realize to know that we live in a fantasy economy because this economy doesn't have any, any linkage with the reality. And, and usually they tell you the other way around, like, but what you are doing is just a metaphor. It is not real. So this is what is real in finance, they usually tell me. But I just realized by listening to you both, and I put this, this slide at the end, uh, that it is the other way around. We, we are, as humans, we are living in a fantasy world that we, as babies, we say no, no, and no. And, and I don't care about the context. I'm gonna work like this forever until I die. So if we change from, from a fantasy economy to real nature, then we're talking about real businesses. And we're talking about what we need as a species. So thank you. This is, this is the presentation for today. Beautiful. Thank you, Hugo. Wow. I like the 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 you know like the, the capability, the systemic view of all these perspectives that they are really emerging and, and it helped a lot to make sense of of how to 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 bridge this uh, these all words that we are trying to, to to bridge now and to understand and uh, to create this this new real nature natural economy, let's say. And all done through collaboration and, and collaboration from the dojo, from the Capital Institute, like as many actors as you, as, you, as you want to mention, they've been helping each other. And I think we are there. So it is just taking us more than we thought, but we are there. Definitely. And now it's a better time than before. Yeah, it feels like a maturing set, maturing fruit, it's getting right. John. You wanted to say something. So yeah, yeah. I just wanted to respond a couple of things. Um, first, I was, as usual, Hugo, that was, that was wonderful. Um, uh, I think the, um, just a, a couple of things I want to respond to. One is um, the, I forget what word you used, the fake economy. Um, fantasy economy. Fantasy economy. I, I actually uh, believe that 
the uh, is everyone familiar with the uh, Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme fiasco? He was the guy that uh, essentially stole billions of dollars from his own Jewish community and then lost it all in a Ponzi scheme. It's, a, it's the largest Ponzi scheme, at least to we, that we know of in the history of humanity. And, um, and in many ways, the economy is a Ponzi scheme uh, for the reasons you just described. And, and I think a lot of these big events, whether it's 9-11 or the financial crisis or in particular the Ponzi scheme, they're kind of like the universe. And frankly, I think Trump showing up, it's, it's sort of the universe kind of shaking us and saying, you know, pay attention. And um, so, I, I mean, there's no question that the global economy is a Ponzi scheme um, that, that can't go on. Um, just, just quickly on the, on the collaboration point, um, uh, uh, Jeff Sue has a, um, a wonderful expression where he says, you know, all of us are fingers pointing at the moon, but the Buddhists say, don't confuse the fingers with the moon. So um, I, th I think the idea of aligning, there, there was actually an effort I was a part of to try to um, align a whole bunch of different principles that people were using into a one set of principles and it, it sort of failed. And I think the, the key is that, you know, everyone would define these principles differently based on their own historic context and their understanding and, and the context of where they're trying to apply them. And so I don't, I don't think it's at, at all important that we converge on one set of principles, um, but it is interesting to see the overlap. And um, uh, we're actually doing that right now with open software principles. And not surprisingly, they're highly aligned with regenerative principles. So um, we're all headed in the same direction. And I couldn't agree more on the collaboration point. Exactly. And, 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 and some principles are better used for some people than from other people. Like the narrative that they, they are carrying um, are different. So some people will resonate with more with exactly. one proposition than another. And that make us, um, you know, like a, big, a bigger possibility of impact and, you know, like transdisciplinary understanding it will have this kind of map of ah oh, you are talking from this but we are aligned or you are a little bit here but i understand from where you are talking so that that give us uh, a very nice tool yeah um so we have 20 minutes uh i would like to hear a little bit somebody else if you want to share but i really want to give john the opportunity the opportunity to talk um about the 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 currencies you you just mentioned before uh i don't know if somebody wants to jump and and say something about what we had been talking today ben is machinating hmm. <laughs> I have something to say, but I, but I, I would, you know, I want to make some space for others. There's some names that are not familiar to me and haven't been a part of these conversations. So I'm just waiting a minute. Yeah, maybe some of you uh, ha haven't been here from the beginning, but um, but we will be posting this record also. Uh, so you can you can watch the whole series. Okay. So John, I think that well, Ben, you want to you want to say something? Uh, I know. Yeah. Um, I mean, the thing the thing that really struck me in in your presentation, Melina, was the, you know the incredible complexity of these structures and some of those images you were showing. I mean, Hugo, you were kind of giving us a a view of how technology can can replicate some of that. And um, I guess I, I, I have a, I'm drawn to complexity. I find that, you know, in the convenings and the structures and the things that, that I help to co-create, like this dojo, for example, that Dunya and I and Leslie Meehan and, and Ryan Rising have been stewarding, we're, we're always battling what seems to be a, a, 
a desire or a need to, to have a lot of complexity with the limits then of people's ability to navigate through all that and have it work. And, um, you know, I know, for example, in the, in the analysis of flocking behavior, you know, um, that you can reduce what a school of fish does or, or a murmuration of starlings to just a few small principles that can generate these very complex behaviors. But I think part of the message from your work, Lean, is it's not always like that in, in the natural world. That, you know, yes, you, you, you know, and in your work, John, we have these eight, eight principles and there's other rubrics that you were identifying as well ago that try to reduce all this to, you know, here's, here's sort of the fundamentals of what's going on. But, but the natural world, you know, just gets so unbelievably baroque in the structures that, that it's creating and the processes and the interactions between them and all the different scales. And, and I guess I'm curious, you know, how much do you think it really is a matter of a few simple principles producing this incredible, incredible complexity um, versus how much do we need to just embrace that it is going to be really complicated, that we're not going to simplify beyond a certain point, or there's, there's a place for simplicity, but, but we can't expect that everything gets there. And, you know, it seems like the more we learn about the natural world and the universe, the more we realize how much more complicated it is than we even can begin to understand, right? That, that, that our knowledge gets bigger, but the universe grows a thousandfold for every bit of you know, unit our knowledge expands. Um, uh, thank you, Ben, to bring in this because this is something that, that we really need to understand. And, and it is about the internal perspective and the external. When you see it from the external perspective and objective and you describe the metabolism, is super heavy, it's super complex. Like a, no, it, the, this information is in, is in any nervous system or in any, you know, like a kind of centralized description, you know, is, is there. But the inner perspective is that all these enzymes are living and experiencing life and metabolism in a way that it's simple for them as well. It's like, a, it's, it's just being what they are. They are enzymes to digest whatever. So they go and digest whatever, you know? And the sense making of how I fit functionally into my ecosystem, in this case, is a metabolism. It, it begins, it, it belongs to another scale, let's say. But but the thing with life is that the this, if you are working with, life's principles, which are very simple, you are embedded already into that uh, experience of that is creating complexity, but it, you are not worried in creating the complexity by itself. And I think that, that that is something very important that we really need to grieve upon is the need of control everything that is gonna happen in the next society. We have been trying to control these things. You know, like we, we know how economics works and we have all these mathematics to explain it. And, but actually, no, it's not like that. And everything is not controllable. You know, and, and that's why everything is now in crisis because it's kind of, just, just let me alone. You know, like just li live life, self-organize, self-regulate, you know, like a bringing this, just basic principles. It's just when, when we look for, when we mention self-organization, just like that, just to name it, it seems that there is something that we not, cannot control, but at the same time that will, something will emerge as order from inside. And, and this inside part, I think that we really need to take it uh, like a, seriously. You know, like we really need trust into the collective uh, emerging properties of what we are creating in order for life to go through those relationships and through those individuals to organize what will emerge. It is super complex. We cannot create a humanity that will make sense. We cannot do it. One, because we are like a sub-level of it. And second, because it's, it's totally complex. Like, you know, but if we, if we live under those principles, 
whatever language or whatever you know like vision and perspective we are taking we are heading into what life creates by itself so that holds the whole uh, process and if we are coming back to what is life and how this is this life is this the other way to do it is this we are having these references there are eight or you know 26 or three or whatever you want to and it is context related use we will get into that complexity at some point in a, in a, in a self-organized way so this is kind of tricky because we really need to grieve our control yes and and i think that that's one of the barriers that that Ugo was talking about, you know, like from grief to trust. So, thank you. Um, John, you have 13 minutes. I'll go quick. Um, and just on, on what you were just saying, one of the things that uh, uh, a, a guy named Robert Ilanowitz, who's another one of my kind of collaborators on all this, writes in his book is that He's a, he's a process ecologist and that that chance is, in fact, I, I almost thought I'm supposed to create a ninth principle called chance <laughs> um, because there is, there is chance at work and chance interacting with diversity, you know, creates emergence in directions that are unknowable and unmanageable and ungovernable. And that's just part of the nature of, and, and, and whether there's some knowing energy out there that's, triggering the chance, who, who knows, but um, it is, it is mind boggling. The other thing, Ben, I would just respond on the complexity and, and simplicity. Um, Nora Bateson has a beautiful saying where she says, the opposite of complexity is not simplicity, it's reductionism. And, um, and recognize what a big deal it is that we've built a entire civilization on reductionist logic for the last 500 years to actually shift. I mean, it's mind boggling to get your head around how fundamentally profound that shift is. And um, so that's the, the struggle. So um, uh, just real briefly, what, what I wanted to share, um, I've spent most of the last 10 years thinking about how to redirect the flow of investment capital toward things that we need capital to flow into as opposed to extractive things and speculative things. And that's operating within the current monetary paradigm, which is a, you know, national currency. And in the case of Europe, multi, you know, regional currency um, uh, system. And uh, Bernard Leotard, you know, for who, by the way, invented the Euro and it was co-opted into a, um, a single currency without a um, governance union. So it, 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 was, it was used in a way he never intended it. He intended it to be a complementary currency to the national currencies. And the politicians got a hold of it and decided to make it into this competitive thing that would compete with the dollar and basically undermined the European individual countries, except perhaps Germany's ability to survive because there's no longer an ability for different national economies to adjust to different realities. So it's actually, a, uh, it, it, it actually gave him great consternation. In fact, it might've been the cause of his depression. Um, but in the last few years of his life, he learned about blockchain and while well, he spent his career promoting the idea of complementary currencies, legitimate complementary currencies, with the idea, you know, based on the exact same um, uh, 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 rigorous and, and um, um, factual analysis of living systems, um, which is a, I can do a quick uh, picture of it, just a picture tells a thousand words. Um, um, but the, you know, the idea that um, uh, in living systems, they shears, can't talk and chew gum at the same time. Um, sorry. 
uh, just flipping to a different uh, chart for a second. Um, everyone able to see that? The window of vitality? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So in, in living systems, uh, Yelanowitz discovered that they balance resilience and efficiency. And of course, economics is all about the pursuit of efficiency. And so we moved our financial system and the entire economy off to the right. And, you know, the financial system collapsed and, they, I, you know, one could easily argue the global economy has collapsed. And, um, and so thus the need for diversity that builds resiliency, which doesn't mean that diversity is the answer or resiliency is the answer. It means that balance is, is the principle. So Bernard used this exact same awareness and argued in favor of complementary currencies because rather than a monocurrency, which is super efficient, um, but very brittle, like the US dollar system uh, that we have now, he used it to argue for complementary currencies. And um, so there's sort of two basic pathways to deal with shifting the financial system. One is to figure out how to shift the flows of financial capital to being more regenerative, uh, less extractive, more, you know, get, move it out into the cellular levels, you know, get it away from the hierarchical top down and, have it flow into real economy as opposed to speculation, but it's all within the current uh, monetary system. And the other is to, uh, you know, modify the actual monetary system. And I felt that the latter, and there's been lots of experiments with complementary currencies and it's all interesting, but it's all very, you know, cottage industry kind of stuff. Um, Um, but, um, my, my business partner, um, uh, Ernesto von Pieborg said to me a few months ago, he said, John, what are the chances of the regenerative economy not being triggered by blockchain technology or dependent on blockchain technology or influenced by this whole crypto thing? And I said, that's easy, zero. <laughs> and, um, so... We've, we've gotten religion on this and I'm sort of late to the party and I'm not an expert by any means, but I'll just share with you um, how we're thinking of using this just as a, as a, as a stimulus to all of our collective thinking. Um, and, I, and I won't be able to do justice to this in, in two minutes, but um, imagine, uh, we're, so we're gonna launch a course on regenerative and, and let me back up by saying, Hugo, I totally committed to the place-based bottom-up, you know, to me, water is part of honors community in place. I'm totally with you. I also think we need to approach this from the, the system that exists today, which is organized around nation states and, and corporations. So I see the two of those meeting somewhere in the middle down the road, um, but, I'm embarked on uh, creating a course to teach regenerative economics um, uh, in, a, in a large scale way, a distance learning course. But, and this is Ernesto's um, vision, rather than give you a little diploma from the Capital Institute, you're going to, you're going to earn a token. And that token is going to be your proof of knowledge that you've passed the basic fundamentals of what regenerative economics means. And eventually there'll be regenerative finance and there'll be regenerative agriculture and we'll create a collaborative effort to um, uh, teach this living systems approach. And the more of these courses people take, the more uh, tokens they'll earn. So they now have proof of knowledge, but to train, to transform the global economy, that knowledge needs to be put into practical effort, into work in the real world. And so uh, somehow we will have the algorithm understand that Ugo took the course, but then he went off in his, in his day job and is working on all these projects where they're implementing these ideas in the real world. And so that token will then either be, you know, you'll either get more tokens for that or it won't depreciate. Whereas if you took the course and then did nothing with it, it would depreciate. Uh, with the idea that eventually um, when corporations wake up and governments wake up and say, how do we create a regenerative economy? 
there'll be thousands of, you know, and, and, and by the way, the biomimicry, this should be blended in with biomimicry education somehow in a way I can't figure out yet. But that's the knowledge that we need people to have. And so um, the, the, um, the people that, you know, like Walmart just announced it wants to be a regenerative company. They have no idea what that means. I don't think that's possible, but they're gonna wanna hire people that understand what that means and have them figure out how to implement that inside the context of the enterprise called Walmart. And if you flash forward, you know, into the, the, the John's imagination of the future, um, governments will realize that if they truly recognize that we need to shift to living systems thinking and, and regenerative economies, they will understand that one of the really smart things they could do is to begin to accept these tokens for payment and taxes, because in doing that, they're essentially incenting people to work on the transformation of the regenerative economy. And this is Melina and I were, were in, a, in an email conversation. I don't know which form of mutation this is, but, but it has the potential to actually mutate the DNA of capitalism um, if, if, um, if, if done correctly. But you know, at the very least, my, my main message is that I, I do think that bl uh, blockchain or holochain technology um, will become the platform to um, vastly complexify the monetary systems that the economy uses and therefore create the potential for much more complexity to manage the economy than we have today, where essentially you have a central bank that raises or lowers interest rates to either grow or shrink the economy, none of which has anything to do with, you know, moving toward a regenerative system. So I'll leave it at that. Wow, John, are you doing this with with the Ubiquity University or the- Yeah, MRI? it'll be the, the course, in fact, Ubiquity, um, so yes, we, we the course, uh, we're not sure if it'll be, so the course is gonna be a 12 session course, and I'm not sure yet whether we'll offer the full 12 sessions through Ubiquity or a shortened version of it, like three or four, um, but they, absolutely they're partners, and in fact, they were really intrigued with this whole tokenization. Mm -hmm. the, the, the tokenization uh, concept can apply to the entire Ubiquity University, not just to our course. And so um, they've got, as I say, the, they've got their guys with, with ponytails and beards <laughs> who understand all this stuff way better than I do, uh, working with us on it. And, um, okay, thanks. and of course, ultimately, the, you know, this connects to the RCN because um, all of the work that happens on the ground would become, in many ways, my view would be this is how you create guaranteed minimum income for the project work on the ground because the, um, uh, the people that do that work would earn these tokens and those tokens would become valuable. Um, and so it's essentially a way for for people to have a, a second source of income if this all were to be, be possible. But yeah, right. anyway, so I've been busy doing, uh, you know, getting the, the, the basics for the course. It'll be a few fundamentals lectures and then a number of dialogues with various mm -hmm. quote unquote experts in the field. Um, but, but more geared toward the business world in this case. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of you know, from permaculture on up, work being done on how to do this work on the ground, but the business world is, you know, absent any real understanding of what this means for them. This is really great to have them on board. <laughs> yeah, thank you, John. Um, and we are just arrived to the end of our conversation today. We have no more time. Uh, that was amazing, John. Thank you for sharing everything you shared. Uh, and, and, and I feel that this conversation is really, um, you know, like maturing and going to, to some, somewhere that we already don't know exactly where it is, but, but I feel really trust in, in what we have been doing. Um, so thank you very much. And if somebody else wants to say something just I will open the, the, the mics for all to express 
one word uh, to uh, to what we did in these three sessions or one session if you the first time you were here. Um, so who wants to start? I will pass it to Hugo. Hugo pass it after that. Yeah, thank you. Well, what, what I feel is that there is this convergent evolution that you were talking about and that we cannot do more than now, what we are every day. So whether they, they are too many expressions of, of the same thing or, or enough diversity, the balance is found in reality in the ecosystem. And it's also given by the contextual conditions. So I think this is one of the principles that I like for a fit function. And, and I like this idea of not focusing on the symptoms, but actually trying to get a new perspective. And sometimes I coming from a technology background now, but my feeling getting into technology is that the guys inside technology, they are not understanding nature. So just be aware of the of the dangers. It is like asking the same kind of advices to the to the people in finance without a full reconnection with nature. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what we share. We share this deep reconnection. And this is where we should be stronger mm -hmm. uh, by sharing, by walking the talk, by being, and by trying to help each other whenever we see the opportunity to do it because we cannot, this, we cannot do this on our own. That's, that's completely for sure. And as John was envisioning, we need to find a bridge uh, and we are getting there. I, I, I feel that in between all these theories, but especially our understanding, we're bringing this kind of uh, energy infusion to, to the metabolism of our own species. And by understanding the, the, the morphogenetic fields that Rupert Sheldrake is talking about, then Today we did our job of opening our hearts and, and and just being able to share and to receive and to give in in a beautiful way. So thank you, John, for your time. I think this sharing is important, and and thank you, Melina, for showing us and and sharing with us uh, this biology. That even though that I have studied most of these functions, like you keep bringing insights, and and I wish more biologists will be in every single conversation you know we, we need biology uh, everywhere and this is my biggest learning from biomimicry that biology should be represented everywhere uh, just just in any important discussion so thank you thank you thank you everyone okay john i love word Oh, my last word is just gratitude for organizing this and, and holding this space, uh, both you and Ugo. I, I, know, um, I know this is hard and uh, I, I really resonate with what you said, Ugo. We're, we're all doing just what we're supposed to be doing. And, um, you know, the universe is our, our biggest ally is, is the, as the pressure rises, the, um, the, the system responds to the pressure. So we can take a little bit of the burden off our shoulders and know that it's heading in the right direction. Um, so. Breathing together for the emergence of the new humanity. Liquidifying <laughs> here. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Thanks everyone. All. Be well. Ciao.